क्रिकेट के लिए ठीक है तो कल ओके वेलकम बैक आई होप यू हैव हैड अ गुड लिटिल ब्रेक बिकॉज द लास्ट सेशन वी आर गोइंग टू कवर a little bit more of the meta analysis but more importantly how to make sense of it all so i'll have to take you back all the way to the first seminar um rem remember we are doing these in 40 minute sessions so this is the eighth seminar so seven seminar backs is when we started and you're going to have to think back now to that time to figure out how best we are going to interpret the evidence that we have captured so reminding you once again that framing of the question searching of the literature extraction of the data synthesis of the data and now we have all of this available to us we are going to make sense of the data and the purpose of performing a meta analysis in the examples i am going to use is to try to make some recommendations for practice so you can see that if you are telling it, people, uh, we are not able to see your screen so let me just share it one more time yes we can see it now thank you okay thank you thank you so uh, look apologies one more time for uh, this difficulty with the screen sharing but we are here the five steps are framing question searching literature data extraction synthesis and if you are going to make recommendations to people to say do this or don't do this you better be confident that the evidence that you are going to use for making the recommendation is strong so when you make a recommendation the first most important thing is to select the correct outcome measure and then to select the correct design uh in this particular example which happens to be about uh preterm birth in constructing this table it has been assumed that the outcome necrotizing enterocolitis is an important outcome measure so if you go back to the first or second uh sessions you will remember that in the structured question outcome was a key element and i may have mentioned to you that core outcome measures or core outcome sets are now becoming uh, available in the published literature and these are sets of outcomes where there is consensus amongst experts but also amongst patients that these outcomes are important so in prematurity for the baby avoiding necrotizing enterocolitis is an important outcome measure and i presume if there is any neonatologist in the group of 38 who are participating today uh, you will confirm that this is so the interventions of interest are two types of medications given to the mother atosiban or beta mimetics now even though this is a randomized trial you will remember that when randomized trial was like the threshold for study design for selection and this is often called level a evidence but 
it could have limitations, right? Because when we perform quality assessment, perhaps in the trial, there is measurement bias. Perhaps in the trial, there is some, some other flaw. So if such things occur, the randomized trial actually falls down from its high status um, to a status where we lose confidence in its trustworthiness. So I'm going to show you two examples of how we can examine uh, the effect of study design uh, um, and and the, and the effect of study quality assessment at the time of performing meta-analysis. So here we have an example. If the example is about relationship of benzodiazepine exposure in pregnancy and uh, association with malformations in the baby. So the overall result is uh, similar to the one we've seen before. It shows the possibility of an association. And when we assess the difference in result according to study design, we notice that only the case control design is what supports the association. The cohort studies do not support the association. In fact, the average result in this case is in the direction of benefit from exposure because it is on the left-hand side of one. So can you see now that uh, the, an overall meta-analysis can be subgrouped according to study design? And this can give you more information about the effect of study design. And study design, remember, is a marker of study quality. Uh, how the results in the studies vary according to study design. Any, any comment about what I've shown in this slide? Hello, this is Robert. I'm just asking yes, go ahead. Um, if the cohort des design has more power or is more important in this case, the case control design. So the case control design, if you remember, we start with the outcomes. We go back in time and check whether there is exposure or no exposure. So you can imagine that if you ask a mother who has a baby with a malformation and ask her whether you took uh, benzodiazepines during pregnancy, perhaps she's more likely to recall that she did mm -hmm. uh, compared to control group where the baby is perfectly healthy. The mother has no worries. She's even going to say, why are you wasting my time asking this question? she will just not remember even if she had taken benzodiazepines because she's too busy looking about a normal looking after a normal healthy baby and enjoying life uh, with the baby so can you see the ps control design suffers the possibility of what is called recall bias in the determination of the association between exposure and outcome On the other hand, in cohort design, you will start with mothers who were known to be given a prescription for benzodiazepine and control mother and uh, unexposed mothers. 
who were not given such a prescription. And you will follow them up until the baby is born to check whether the baby has malformation or not. Can you, can you see that, the difference? Yes, of course. All right. So you can see that you are more likely to trust the cohort design. And you can now see that it's only the case control design, which is showing the possibility of the association, not confirmed by the cohort design. Now you also, when you made the comment that cohort study is more powerful, can you say what you mean, meant when you said the cohort study is more powerful? I, I meant that it has more value. Um, okay, for, for us. all right. So at this stage, I think I would throw this word out to the group to say, what do you understand when somebody says, a study has statistical power. Now we are definitely not talking about the general word power in terms of value as described a moment ago. We're talking about a technical term, statistical power. What is meant by statistical power? Probably the, the study has um, more people incorporated and larger groups. <laughs> Okay, so let me just show you this study by the name Bracken. You see this one, which is the second last in the case control group. Can you, can you see that? Yes. I'm pointing it out with my arrow. Yeah. You, you can see that? Yes. All right. And then, Can you see the last study in the cohort design? Or no, you can see that also? Yeah? Yes. Of these studies, which study is more powerful? Probably the, the case control study. And why would you say that? Because the square is a bit larger or? Or the, or the horizontal line of the confidence interval is shorter. smaller. Smaller, yes. Okay, so can you see colleagues that the forest plot is extremely useful in assessing statistical power. And in this case, because the studies are subgrouped by, um, quality of design, the general power or value of the design. So having made that comment, I'll now take you to the second example I wanted to show you, which is about study quality. Here you will remember the few studies that I showed you when first describing the forest plot. And now these studies are all randomized. And these randomized studies have been broken down according to their quality. And these two studies are of high quality because they score high on a quality scale used. And these studies are of low quality because they score low on a quality assessment scale used. And here you can see that the low quality studies have a diamond that does not cross one. And the high quality studies have a diamond that crosses one, but more importantly, the point estimate is on the harmful side of the value one. Any comment or question concerning now the use of the highest design randomized control trial, but use of detailed quality assessment to stratify 
or group studies according to this assessment. Okay, so with this background in mind, now we return back to this table, which is designed to make an assessment of the strength of the evidence. Here you can see that the design chosen is of the highest level, but the limitations within this design have been found to be serious. In this case, you can begin to worry about whether or not using this evidence, you are in a position to make strong recommendations. Okay, we now move to another item concerning uh, strength of evidence, which is related to our um, PICO question. So here is a news item published in, uh, well, on the web, which says that vitamin C can help improve uh, fertility. And actually this news item says that uh, when vitamin is used, you can conceive easily. Well, perhaps the name of the product is made uh, in, 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 in this way to sell it well. And this is the study that it uses to write that report in, on, on the web. And this study talks about an outcome measure called sperm DNA fragmentation. It's not talking about taking a baby home after being pregnant and having delivered. So can you see that this out outcome sperm DNA fragmentation is not really a direct measure of whether there will be a baby born? Can you see that? So sometimes uh, authors can end up what is called cherry picking, what is called cherry picking, and they report their papers according to what is statistically significant in their paper. And With this, I take you back to our chart for assessing strength of evidence. So while in this particular uh, analysis, we are looking at an important outcome measure, necrotizing enterocolitis, there are probably several ways to measure whether somebody has necrotizing enterocolitis. This diagnosis could be made by an X-ray, <clears throat> or perhaps there are more subjective ways to make uh, this assessment. And if there is indirectness in this type of outcome measurement assessment, this could also introduce serious weakness inside the study. Okay, as far as inconsistency is concerned, this is something we measure. Uh, there, there is a comment by Robert, you wrote something, but I'm afraid I, I, I don't speak your language. Can, can you translate what you wrote? I, I just tried to 
warn our colleague that uh, she made. Ah, there is a there is a noise in the background. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Th thank you for thank you for doing that. Okay. Uh, so, looking beyond meta-analysis is important to understand the quality assessment. And feature, another feature of quality assessment is uh, inconsistency. Inconsistency refers to heterogeneity. And a simple method of measuring heterogeneity is... Uh, is to calculate a p-value by chi-square test, which is calculated here. Uh, so you can see that the results may, but, but the first thing you can do is you can see whether the studies are in general, the say, giving the same result or opposite results. And then you can go on and calculate statistically whether they are same or different. Uh, and even calculate a p-value for whether they are same or different by chance. So this dispersion of studies in the forest plot across different uh, sides of the value one gives an idea of inconsistency of the findings across the studies included in the ev evidence. And finally is imprecision Imprecision simply refers to the width of the confidence interval, particularly in the diamond. And here we have something called other considerations. And one of the other considerations is publication bias. So I give you an example, real example of publication bias that hopefully helps you see why it is important to make this assessment. So here is a, a paper that uh, highlights the effect of a treatment for infertility for males. And it concludes that uh, there was heterogeneity uh, across the data. Um, but interestingly, if you see further, they go on to conclude that antioxidants significantly increase the rate of both live birth and pregnancy rate. Can you see that this type of conclusion is in my opinion, not safe because it's been acknowledged that there is severe heterogeneity but it's not been really taken into account in, uh, in uh, making a conclusion. Okay, so now we return to one more time to the summarizing of the evidence for interpretation. And here we, uh, we can easily conclude that in light of indirectness of uh, the question, limitations in respect to quality, despite there being randomized trial and an important outcome measure, the quality of the evidence is low, which means that the trustworthiness of our finding uh, with respect to making any conclusion concerning practice uh, is low. So I'm gonna stop here and leave you to ask any question or make any comment about uh, where we stand just now.
Okay, so we have uh, approximately 20 minutes left. Uh, and Esther has asked me a question, how do you qualify evidence for level A or lower? So typically, um, we use a design-based hierarchy of evidence, which we reviewed uh, in, in the earlier section. Here, we had levels of evidence assigned. So for example, in this case, for, from my point of view, I have simply constructed the hierarchy with a smiley face and a sad face and one in the middle, but you can call this A, B, and C. And here is another one where the levels are described with a numerical scale with an alphabetical letter attached to it. And here it says systematic reviews of randomized trials are at the highest level of evidence. So they call it 1A. In other hierarchies, they might call it A only. So this is how the hierarchies for design-based uh, research, design-based hierarchy uh, are created and exist in the published literature. Does that clarify your comment? Uh, Esther, okay, you said thank you. Well, thank you for your question. Uh, any other question at, concerning any step of the systematic review, uh, not just the last two that we have just covered today? Okay, so the Deja asks the difference between case series and cohort. Uh, so that's a good question. Just like we examined the other day that case, that case control is described badly in the literature, so is uh, the problem of describing cohort study and case series correctly in the literature. So I take here an example of uh, published uh, material. Okay, well, this one relates to case control and cohort studies. And uh, <clears throat> I think I can show you an example from the same paper. So just give me a moment to find the relevant uh, paper which I should be able to. Okay, so uh, I'm, I'm struggling a little here myself uh, to, so single case report is simply a report of a single case, a single patient. But when we have more than one patient, and in some literature it is described that at least five patients, or in, in others it is at least 15 patients. So, well, oh, 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 all of these are subjective distinctions. Uh, so I'm not here to say five cases makes a series or 15 makes a series or 10 makes a series. I simply want to highlight here that in publications, you might find that a few single patients 
described together may be included in a case report and described as a case report of several cases, but at the same time, several cases may be put together and described as a case series. Um, a cohort study would typically have, in addition to the series of cases with uh, with uh, with uh, exposure, a cohort study would also have description of uh, cases without the exposure. So here is the one I was looking for to describe to you. And if I can just make this bigger, it will make my task a little easier. Okay, so here is the diagram I was looking for. So case report is in this, in this paper described as a single case. And then when this single case is followed up for longer and combined with several other cases, it becomes after a period of time, a case series. So this is the approach they have used in describing uh, the difference between case report and case series. So in, in, and, and in this case, they are making clear that they are talk, talking about a particular type of disease and they are just following cases up of that type of disease so they don't have any comparison with anybody else. There's simply a description of a series of cases with a particular diagnosis. In this case, the outcome of this group of cases. Does that make sense? Tadeja, you asked that question. I'm putting the question to you. Does this make sense? Well, I'm happy to take any more questions or any comments uh, that you might have. Do you hear me? Yes, I do. Yeah, I'm sorry, I had problems with computer. No I, I had, um, I have a problem with, like I have, a, I did the abstract of 150 patients about that we followed with the same diagnosis. So this was my question, is this a cohort study or is this, is this a, ser a patient series? Yeah. understand so, my question. Look, uh, I think uh, to call description of one group of people, over a long period of time, followed up without any comparison, will be described as a case series. But if you have a comparison group, then I think it will be called a cohort study. Okay, thank you. And, and I'm basing my answer according to this example paper that I have just shown you. I hope you can see it on the screen. You, you can see it on the screen? Yes. Yeah. Uh, but look, I will not be surprised if you looked at other papers that they might give you other definitions. Okay, thank you. Okay. Okay, so perhaps there is uh, another question in the chat. Let me have a look. So while there is a notice that we have only about three or four minutes left, uh, if you have one or two last questions, I'll be happy to take them now.
Okay, well, if there are no questions, I'm grateful to, <coughs> to you all for uh, taking, taking time to attend my webinars over the three days. As I have written in an email to you, these uh, videos of these webinars will be available on my, uh, my YouTube channel. In fact, uh, apart from the ones from today, the other six are available already. I am also available to you at any time should you have any questions or you want a consultation. <clears throat> this is an open offer. Uh, just contact me via the email you have received from us. And uh, with this, I'd like to wish you a fantastic weekend and a great Christmas, which you will face just within a few weeks from now. <laughs>